welcome everybody. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to everyone who's here in this virtual room and to the Ohio Anna Festival. Um, my name is Moriel Rothman Zecker. I'm a novelist and poet based in Yellow Springs, Ohio, and I'm honored and grateful to be moderating this panel, um, which is titled Writing Great Genre Fiction, but could really be titled Writing Great Fiction. Um, and I think my, my intent, my goal, my hope for today is to keep the, the first half of the discussion, um, you know, pretty light spirited. I have some questions for all the panelists. I want to introduce everyone to you all, and then we'll open up time, space for audience questions. Um, the way to do that would just be to type any questions you have into the, into the chat box, and then I'll direct them to um, whichever panelist is, is relevant to the question or to everyone, if there are questions for everyone. And then we'll take it from there. If we have extra time, we can also break into sort of an informal discussion between the panelists. And so everyone feel free to jump in at any point if they have something to add, something that sparks their imagination. Um, yeah, and we'll, and we'll take it from there. So first introduce the panelists, introduce the novelists with us today um, in alphabetical order. We have Sheldon Gleiser, um, whose short stories, Souvenir, Converts, Secrets of the Hive, and Stillborn were runners up in 2006, 2008, 2010, and 2012 for the Mary Shelley Awards for New Stories of Horror, Fantasy, and Science Fiction. Dinosaurus Rex published, Dianosaurus Rex, excuse me, um, published in October of 2019 by Hydra Publications is Sheldon's first novel. Um, and I asked all of the panelists to send in an additional fact that they don't usually send for um, third person bios. So I'll, I'll add those in here at the end. So about Sheldon, um, many people say, Sheldon seems like he belongs in GQ magazine. And indeed, Sheldon was interviewed by GQ magazine. Um, he was working at that point at the Ohio Department of Public Safety, making PSAs and traffic, traffic safety films. And when G GQ did an article about the late 50s and early 60s, um, very violent traffic safety films with titles including uh, Mechanized Death, they interviewed Sheldon about how those films were made. So that's a, a fact on the side about Sheldon's experience with um, GQ and traffic safety, the violent traffic safety films of the 50s and 60s. Um, so next we have Anne-Marie Lutz, who is the author of three fantasy novels, um, the Color Mage novels, which are titled Black Tide and Sword of Jashan, and her new standalone novel, Taylor She's written several short stories, appearing most recently in Strange Fiction Zine and Bards and Sages Quarterly. And as a bonus fact, um, Anne-Marie writes that she loves to travel when she can because travel frequently sparks new ideas for stories, which touches, I think, a little bit on some, something we're gonna talk about a little later, um, but thank you for sharing that, that detail. Um, next we have RJ, RJ Norgard, who was born and raised in Port Clinton on Lake Erie and spent 20 years in the US Army as a counterintelligence technician before settling in in Anchorage, Alaska where he worked as a private investigator for eight years. Now back in his hometown, RJ writes full-time and is currently working on his second Sydney Reed mystery. Um, and as a side note about RJ, RJ is an avid amateur historian and the vice president of the Ottawa County Historical Society, which um, we can also touch, touch on later about how your historical work um, connects to your fiction. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Next, we have John Vanek, um, who is a physician, novelist, and poet, um, with works published in numerous literary journals in four countries and showcased on public media. Um, he's garnered awards in both fiction and poetry and has been invited to read his work at colleges, the Akron Art Museum, the Cleveland Clinic, and the George Bush Presidential Library. The Father Jake Austin Mystery Series um, features a Roman Catholic priest protagonist who is a 21st century Father Brown. And an additional fact about John is that he practiced medicine for years at a Catholic hospital where he became close friends with two priests, 
Um, and in this process, realize that the stereotypes most people hold about priests, both as saints and as sinners, are wrong, um, as are all stereotypes. Priests are simply human with individual flaws and strengths. Um, and this is how John portrays his protagonist in his novels, Father Jake Austin. And finally with us, we have T.G. Wolf, who writes mysteries that play with the gray area between good and bad, right and wrong. Cause and effect drive the stories where cause is more often a symptom of a bigger, more challenging problem. T.G. Wolf holds a master's degree in civil engineering and is a member of Mystery Writers of America and Sisters in Crime. An additional fact is that T.G. wrote technically engineering reports for 15 years before trying her hand, first trying her hand in fiction. So thank you all. And thank you for those, those bonus, bonus facts about yourself. I think it's a nice way to um, get, a, get a different corner of your life as we, as we dive into the fiction that all of you are writing. And, um, and so, and, and with that, I think my first question for everyone, and maybe we'll just do it in alphabetical order again to keep it, to keep it simple. But the first question for all of you, and touch on whatever part of this is most interesting for you to talk about and say, go with that, is what is it like to start a new project? And or how do you know when you're done? So what, what is the spark that leads you into a new novel, into a new story? And how do you know when a story is finished? Um, well, I, I, since, since we're going alphabetical order, I assume it's, uh, I assume it's me. I, My last um, name, yeah. That is a, that's a tough question to really quantify because um, I'm, a, a lot of times, first of all, I'm not, there are very few times when I just kind of get an idea and go, oh, that's my idea and, and go start because usually I'm in the middle of something else or, or something. And, and a lot of times I don't really know what's gonna work and what isn't until I'm, sitting at the typewriter or sitting at the word processor and and typing away and as for when it's done <laughs> boy uh i'm gonna have to rely on that old saw that work wait somebody said works of art aren't they're fin they aren't finished they're just kind of abandoned and i think that's kind of true uh dianosaurus rex the novel went through so many permutations and it, and it was so long getting to the point that it was a man, was a publishable manuscript that, uh, I mean, I, I can tell you how I got the idea and where I went from there, but um, it, it went through a lot of, a lot of problems. <laughs> and, I, and if I started talking and telling about everything, like I'd, I'd take up the entire panel, so I don't want to do that. Um, I'm I'm sorry I don't have a better answer, but for me that's about that's about the best I can do. I don't know how other people have, but maybe that's wonderful. Hopefully, no, there's hopefully, no. I mean, go ahead. Oh, there's no there's no need to apologize for it. I think all, all of these questions we're all shooting in the dark here, and I think what I want to generate is discussion. So there's no need to have a. Uh, a singular answer to any of these questions. Take it, take it as it's interesting. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, Emery, how about you? Um, yeah. Um, in terms of starting a new project, uh, it seems to take a while with me, but a lot of times what sparks ideas is if I'm lucky enough to be traveling somewhere and I get out of my usual rut and something strikes me. For the Color Mage novels, um, the world building was actually sparked by going to a coastline where there were lighthouses and just kind of imagining that instead of being uh, for their actual purpose that they were actually towers where mages would be able to defend the land from magical attack, which was part of the world building for Color Mage. So I can't really say because uh, the beginning of new projects is kind of unpredictable for me. Talenor was quite a while in the making and kind of developed as it went um, because I am a discovery writer and don't necessarily do an outline. Um, I, it takes me a while and I may have a project sitting in the back of my head for a while before I have worked on it enough and developed it enough to realize this is a novel, this is a story. 
Um, in terms of the ending, my, my, my novel length things take quite a while to write. And I know when they're not done. I know when something feels as if it's missing. I know as if my critique group tells me it's, you know, something's not there. And I know when I have to go back and put things in, but I, I, I think that when I know it's done is when there's a feeling of satisfaction that it's come to the ending I want it to come to. It's very, individual i think as to when the project's done for my for my process anyway um yeah i think I, that's probably all i <laughs> all i have to on that uh, but the uh since i'm the, the individual the beginning of a project as i said is is more definite because i'll get an idea of the ending it can take it took i, I think a year for um the second book, the Sword of Jashan book, it took a year before I felt that that was done. And RJ. Okay, uh, so for me, uh, what will happen is I'll get an idea for a premise and, uh, and I'll just kind of kick it around, the idea around in my head and I'll maybe start to uh, play with some ideas for characters um, there's, uh, there's, there's a novel that I'm, uh, in the planning stages on, I've done a little bit of writing on it and it's, uh, it's a historical mystery novel set during prohibition and, um, uh, and going back to the, my love of history, I think that's kind of informed that also, but, um, but anyway, I have this idea for a premise I've written, um, some chapters, I've written some, a little bit of character, uh, little biographical things about the, the, that I think the character, uh, attributes the character will have. And I just start playing with that and a plot evolves from that. And that's just how I kind of get going. And um, as far as when I'm done, um, for me, I've only finished one novel, so uh, for me, I, I guess I knew it was done um, when it, it sounds kind of trite, but it just sort of felt done. Um, and, and, and like my uh, 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 predecessor just said, I, I kind of knew when it wasn't done. And um, I just kept working on it and working on it. And you get to a point where it feels right. Um, and... Um, you get to a point where you just have nothing else to say. You've, you've, and, and particularly for a mystery novel, I think it's a very, a little bit more of a structured thing uh, than uh, so perhaps some other types of novels. And so you've, you know, you've fulfilled your plot objectives um, and all of that. And when, when I, in terms of the language and the editing and everything, when that all feels done to me and I feel satisfied that I can put it out there and be proud of it, and to me that it's done. Oh. My turn. Uh, with the Father Jake Austin uh, mystery series, what I knew at the beginning was I knew my three main characters. I became friends with two priests and loosely modeled my character after them. I had one priest friend who uh, over a couple of beers told me about his strong feelings for a nun and I went, oh, and uh, made me look again at, at what stereotypes are like. And so I wanted to do a spiritual man uh, making his way through a secular world. So I knew I had Father Jake um, and his, his friend is a black policeman, uh, the chief of police in town. I knew I had him. And the third main character I've got, I modeled after a friend of mine. She's a, a blind lady. Um, and I marvel at how she makes her way through the world uh, against the odds. And uh, so I had my three main characters. And uh, I also decided that I was going to use uh, Ogle in Ohio as the town, and it's also a character because of its uh, underground railroad history. So I had those four things, and I'm a little like Anne Marie. I'm a pantser. I 
I don't plot things out. I have my characters and I throw hurdles at them and then I see how they decide to uh, go about solving the problems. And so it's a, it's a lot of fun for me in the first draft. I love that. Um, I know roughly where I'm going to end and I know the beginning and in between is interesting. Um, as far as when it's over, I would probably write until they took the typewriter away or the pen from me. Uh, so thank God they got published. I, I have three books in the series uh, and I just got a contract for three more. So I guess I'll be writing for a while. Great. That's all I got. Thank you. And uh, for me, you know, the ideas start with little sounds like, huh, or, hey, that's interesting, or, I wonder. The, uh, the nugget that started Widow's Run was a story on NPR that talked about how the classic detectives, what made them so powerful was they had nothing to lose. That there was no family, there was no ties, and, and the immense amount of freedom that came with that. And I was like, oh, I want one of those. And hence, I created this character and the plot just drove itself because she had no bounds. For my other mystery series, The De La Cruz Files, those are a little bit more plot driven. And in all, th well, the two that are published and the one I'm working on now, all of those started out with the question, what if, you know, it started with the, with the bad guy. What if somebody did this? How would everything react? How would the people react? How would the police react? And then it just, it's a natural progression. Um, as far as when they end, because I do write mysteries, it ends when the mystery is resolved. And it's it sort of, for me, it's that simple. Um, I am a process person. So once I get from point A to point Z and the first draft is done, I then have a, a pretty prescribed process that I go through for reviewing it, getting beta readers, and it kind of goes into the shoot and it comes out the other end. So for me, every part's fun. I never thought I'd be one who enjoyed editing, but it's a different kind of fun than the creating. Um, I love when I'm editing and I make myself laugh. And I'm just, or I make myself cry. The one time I gave myself a headache that lasted for three hours because I cried over a funeral scene that I wrote for pretend people. <laughs> My husband's like, really? Like, I was a good funeral. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. And, and thank you for all of these stories, all of these details. Um, it's really nice. It, gets, it, it feels energizing to hear where all of you are coming from and um, to hear about your processes. And just a note, a word to the audience. Um, if folks have questions that come up in any of this, feel free to type them over to me directly, um, even if it's before the question and answer period, just so I'll have it flagged and perhaps weave it in. Um, the next question I have for everyone is, it touches on some things that many of you um, addressed. And I think what, what I was interested in when thinking about this is, is minor characters, right? Oftentimes, you know, we talk about a novel and we know there's a protagonist or an antagonist and, you know, in interviews or in panels, that will be the discussion. But to really make a compelling world, minor characters have to exist and have to be connected to the author and have to have lives of their own and backstories of their own, even if those backstories don't necessarily make their way front and center um, into the novel. And so I think I was just curious, I wanted to hear from you all, if you all would tell us about a, a minor character in one of your works who maybe didn't get the center stage, but who you feel very connected to or interested by, or, um, or who has an element to them that brings something deep to the novel, even though they're not the, not the star. Okay, are, are alphabetical order again? Should I just go? Sure, yeah, wonderful. Okay, <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, all right, uh, as quickly as I can, Di the novel Dinosaurus Rex came from the fact that like everybody on the face of the earth, I was fascinated with dinosaurs. 
So uh, somebody called them nature's special effects. So I had, I got this glimmer of an idea of uh, a guy who invents a method to send modern day organic waste back through time and uh, where it will then rot and become oil. So, uh, so he wanted to make the United States, instead of dependent on the Middle East, just, we would just have more oil than we knew what to do with by doing that. And, but, and of course, what was going to happen is either somebody was going to go back in time or a dinosaur was going to come through. And I felt like that was an idea that had just been done to death. Like after Jurassic Park, it's like, do we really need another dinosaurs on the loose story? And uh, I, so because, because of that, I was, I just kind of went, well, I don't really know what to do with this. I like the idea. I don't know what to do with it. All right. So then um, I just kind of had the idea in the back of my mind one day, I turned on the TV to, for something to watch while I was eating lunch. And there was a Taylor Swift video. And I watched that for a little while. And then I switched the channel again. And there was the David Cronenberg version of The Fly. And, uh, and suddenly it just, it all fell into place. It's like teenage girl mixes her atoms with a dinosaur. And so it's like her parents are doing this experiment. She, these terrorists who are actually industrial spies masquerading as terrorists come in, they mess it up. They send her back through time. The parents bring her back, but she's brought back with enough DNA. She was beamed through a Tyrannosaurus Rex. She's brought back with enough of this T-Rex DNA that she's now completely, that, she, that she's now not exactly human. I mean, she looks normal, but um, her skin is almost impermeable to bullets. She's super strong, super fast, can smell things 20 miles away and all that kind of stuff. And she uses this to, she uses these abilities to track down her parents' killers. Now in the process of this, there was a, uh, in the process of this, her mother became a little more of a character than I thought she was going to be. I mean, I knew this kid was going to need a, a mom and she was going to need a boyfriend. And I think that the, the mom and the boyfriend became a little more important than I thought they were going to be. But the, the head of Homeland Security, who, or I'm, I'm sorry, the Homeland Security agent who was assigned to her, uh, to and, and suspects in the back of his mind that there's something going on with this kid that's more than normal. He took over a lot of the book in a way that I didn't think he would, to the point that I thought about spinning him off into a separate, a separate or adjoining series or something. Um, but that's uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question exactly. But that's about as close as I can get. So. Um, oh, okay, I guess I'm next. Um, in Talenor, uh, I guess just to set the background, the main character is Jaina, who is a priest uh, who travels a circuit to little towns and villages that can't afford their own priest. And she does things like sing the souls of the departed to her goddess, uh, bless new births, and so forth. And she discovers a... Um, well, it's, I don't, not really talking about Jane. I want to talk about a minor character. But anyway, she discovers something that sets her on a road to rescuing someone from a terrible fate. Along the way, um, there was a secondary character who was a nobleman. His name's Halpin, Halpin de Morn. And he was supposed to make a pretty brief appearance and be a spoiled brat, which is mostly what he is, and that he was supposed to be relatively one-dimensional. And he was just there to be, you know, in a very brief scene to, and to be a spoiled nobleman who was entitled. And it turned out that he actually ended up carrying a, through the novel, having chapters that were his own point of view chapters. And I'm not going to say he ever was redeemed. He's still a spoiled brat at the end, but there were some changes that happened. And um, he started out very minor turned out not so much, not so minor. And I think he is an, a pretty interesting character in my mind. So um, yeah, he, he kind of evolved almost on his own, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, 
in my uh, first novel, um, Trophy Kill, which is part of a series, my main character, Sidney Reed, is a is a private investigator who um, is basically no longer working uh, since his wife passed away. And um, he goes to, he moves into a, 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 an apartment, a rather rundown apartment uh, above, above a coffee shop. And this woman named Rachel St. George owns the coffee shop and she's also his landlady. And so, um, I created I created this character. She's kind of a very quirky, quintessential Alaska kind of a gal, which is to say she's kind of a little more on the rugged side. Um, she is in a relationship with another woman, and uh, she kind of becomes a not only Sydney's landlady but her. Uh, quasi uh, godmother, mentor, friend. Um, so they have these sort of wisecracking, smart alecky conversations. And she kind of is the one person that can sort of put him in his place and keep him grounded. And so she started out as just sort of this, well, okay, it's gonna be his landlady, but um, I've had a lot of fun playing with this character. And, um, through this character have been able to reveal things about my main character that I hadn't at first realized when I created the character. So that uh, was kind of a revelation to me that you can use minor characters to um, illuminate your, your main character. And, uh, and also the one advice, piece of advice I would give to creating a minor character is to give them some unique trait some unique characteristic that readers will remember them by and that will stand out. And as soon as they hear that name, they'll think about the tattoo or about some way they talk or something that distinguishes the character that makes them memorable to the reader. So. Um, in my case, the two minor characters the readers seem to enjoy most. Um, one is a, uh, I was a physician and uh, sometimes surgeon, surgeons irritated me because uh, a lot of them failed char, uh, charm school. And uh, so I decided to make, base one of my minor characters on a, one of these uh, surgeons with a bit of an attitude uh, guide complex. Um, and I enjoyed doing that. Uh, and he starts out as a real irritant for Jake, Father Jake, but uh, in the end becomes a, an ally. Um, but I think the the minor character my readers like the most, and I enjoy the most, is, uh, is the priest's uh, rectory housekeeper. And she's Colleen, she's an Irish lady. She's got a bit of a brogue, which I try to keep to a minimum. Um, and as I write her, I have a good friend who's Irish and I send her my dialogue and I say, Anne, please Irish this up for me. And she, <laughs> she helps me get it right. Um, and the thing about Colleen is that uh, she, she has deference to, to Father Jake as a priest, but she's not shy about expressing her opinion and gives him help once in a while. Um, and she's a fun character for me. So in my Widow's Run book, like every good freelance investigator, you know, she has a, 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 a group that help her. And so I have three minor characters, Ian Black, a man that just goes by the name Irish and Andrew Dixon. Now, each one of these minor characters match up to Diamond in some regard. So Ian matches her in intellect, mm -hmm. Irish matches her in passion and intensity, and um, Andrew Dixon matches her really in, um, in heart, the soul part. So let's talk about Andrew Dixon. Whenever I have a minor character, by the time they hit the page, I usually know what their favorite food is and what music they like to listen to. And if I can humanize them with those two simple things, then usually they'll come out on the page much more multi-dimensional. So with Dixon, Dixon is 17 and he is the computer genius that of course every modern detective needs. Um, he's a delinquent. 
And he, uh, Diamond ends up being his caseworker in part of her former life. And uh, she ends up having to go to court with him because he hacked into Taco 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 and changed the price of beef tacos to a dollar because he was really hungry and all he had was three dollars. You know, so you put that kind of humor in it where you're mixing the idea that he is a computer genius because, hey, every TV show has one. I needed one, but he's still a teenager. Um, there's this other scene that I just love. He wants to learn to drive. His father's an alcoholic, won't take him out. So he convinces Diamond and he tells her that he's, you know, got 10 hours of driving. He didn't tell her that they were all on, um, on video games. So she gets in the car with him and yeah, they're driving on the highways in DC and they barely survived getting to their destination. So just mishing and mashing whatever the element is that is, as, as RJ said, as John said, that quintessential to that, but then balancing it off of your main character so that they both promote each other forward. Every minor character should be able to be the star of his own book. And if a house could drop on that minor character and it doesn't change your story, then you don't need them. They do not meet the status for minor character. They're, they're a cameo. <laughs> hmm. Thanks, thank you. That was, that was fun to hear all of that. Um, and it's a, it's, I feel like it's a non-traditional, but actually really wonderful entrance into a lot of these novels to hear about who, who are the characters supporting um, the, the main stories and the main character there. Um, so now I want to do kind of a, a lightning round, uh, just a few very quick questions to get a little bit more about um, everyone's process and um, backstories. And so really just answer these in, in a few words. And as we're going with this um, over to the audience, if folks have questions that they'd like to add in, um, please start typing them in either to me or to all of the panelists and we'll get to those right after. Um, and so the first lightning round question um, is, you know, just about, about process. What time of day do you write? Oh, uh, first thing in the morning. I find that, uh, for, <laughs> first of all, my 10th uh, grade teacher told us that Ernest Hemingway wrote first thing in the morning standing up. I don't stand up, but I write first thing in the morning. I think, for me anyway, it's, uh, uh, well, you know, somebody said about writing in the morning that you're closest to the dream state so that you can much eat, so stuff flows out of you much easier that you can then, of course, edit later on. So that's my, my quick answer. Um, well, it's, it's the same for me. Uh, I always prefer to write in the morning, although, you know, sometimes things get in the way. But I think that's when my mind is clearest from all the you know, business and um, have to do this, have to do that. Oh my gosh, what about this phone call kind of thing? If I get first thing in the morning, then I'm more likely to get real, real writing done. I like to write first thing in the morning also, but I'll run to the keyboard anytime the mood strikes me and it can be late at night. Mm. I'm uh, also a morning writer. Uh, I think I'm clearest at that point and I generally write till her I'll tell my brain explodes which is usually around noon or one and then I go about uh, marketing or something else or real life in the afternoon so morning for me I daydream during the day and I write it down at night Good. I, I, was, I was hoping there would be a, a divergence in the final answer <laughs> <laughs> and we wouldn't provide the audience with, a single, with, with the idea that there's a single right time to write. Um, so I'm glad, that, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you all. And next question, um, I've, I've found one of the great, great joys of being an author and getting to um, talk in some of these panels is to get to talk about other books that I love. And I guess I just want to throw that over to you and ask, what is a book that you've loved recently that you'd like to recommend to everyone listening and to the, to the rest of us on this panel. Uh, I'm sorry, are we, are we going alphabetical order again? Uh, yeah, we'll keep the same, same order or popcorn. If somebody wants to go first, that's, that's cool with me. But, okay, all right, the, 
of books I've read recently, um, Little Fires Everywhere by uh, Celeste Ng, I believe is her name. That is a terrific book. Um, I would recommend that to anybody. And I don't, I, mean, I don't know how much you want us to elaborate on that, but uh, should I leave it there? Yeah, I, mean, even, I think it would be interesting even say a word about what, what it was about the book that, that you loved. Um, I think the author really gets a lot of stuff such as what midlife crisis is as opposed to um, teenage angst and how similar that stuff is. Um, she gets race, issues of race, she gets issues of class. And it's just, uh, uh, my friend, my, my late friend, Robert Flanagan, who recently passed on, um, uh, he, he was a writer in Ohio. And he, he and I had this like 20 year interrupted discussion about character and plot and what each one is. And that's a book I wish he was around to have read because it's such a perfect amalgamation of both of those things. So, okay, that's it. Um, I have been reading more re fairly, fairly recently, um, say right before, you know, lockdown, uh, had read uh, an amazing book that uh, N.K. Jemison, it's called The Fifth Season, amazing world building, wonderful characterization, and just really well worth reading. Also, since then, I find that my reading has changed a little bit, and perhaps because of everything going on, I'm reading more short works. And what I have really enjoyed um, on, uh, for pure entertainment and also for being extremely well written, are the uh, Murderbot Diaries novellas by Martha Wells. There's, I think, five of them starting, I don't actually remember which was the first one, um, but um, I'm trying to remember the name of the very first one. There's, a, there's five, and I believe she's won awards for at least a couple of them. They, the, the main character is extremely well drawn and is outstanding. Um, it's a, well, I'm, I'm not going to give anything away actually, but uh, they're, they're really what worth reading. They're shorter, which I found very nice during everything going on recently. I just recently uh, read All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. Uh, and that, that had a big impact on me just because, I don't know, the writing is just so poetic. The language, his lang use of language and metaphor, and I, just inspirational to read. Uh, one of the most recent books that I've read is uh, by Michael Carita called How It Happened. Michael's, a, a, I count him a friend and he's been a mentor to me as a writer. Uh, New York Times bestseller. People, if you haven't read him, give him a read. Um, and I think it's what struck me about it is I knew from the get-go, it's, it's a fictionalized version of a true story. I knew from the get-go uh, who did it. And I thought, now how is he going to keep this rolling along? And, I, and he did. I mean, it was just, it was awesome to watch his craft. And uh, besides Michael, I mean, I have a lot of favorite authors, but I think, I, I think Pat Conroy is my hero. Um, I started out as a poet, and his poetic language matched with his dark content, like Prince of Tides and uh, Lords of Discipline, I, I think is just amazing from a craft standpoint. So I took advantage of being the caboose to look up some names because I'm just horrible at remembering names. Um, lately, I've actually been obsessed with going back into some of the roots of mysteries. Um, Dashiell Hammett and the Maltese Falcon and Red Harvest and several, um, several mysteries written around then. One of the things that entertained me the most is to see how American society is different than it is now. Both good and bad is just entertaining. Um, and recently I've gone even further back into the 1800s and uh, doing a little bit of a research project for my podcast where I'm going to be doing adaptations. So currently I am obsessing over Edgar Allan Poe's The Rue Morgue, 
which Murders in the Rue Morgue, which was written in 1841. And the language, the language is amazing. It's so much more complicated than what we do today. I've had to use a ruler to stay on task with it. Um, but I'm just fascinated, especially as I develop an adaptation of, of breaking down that structure. Um, because the rules have changed for how you entertain an audience in 2020 rather than 1840. So uh, I've just been fascinated with those. I definitely encourage people who, who th in some ways think everything's different to go back to some of these roots to see what hasn't changed and uh, really enjoy some amazing writing. Thank you. Um, so now opening up to, over to audience questions and first noting there was an audience member who thought that the alphabetical order was perhaps putting Sheldon too much on the spot, which I think is a point well taken. So let's, we'll, we'll do this next round um, popcorn style. And so if anyone has a, has an answer to the question, feel free to jump in and hopefully we can kind of read each other's Zoom boxes enough. That there's not too much technological crashing. Um, the question is, this first question is from Sherry Heinrich. Um, and this is really just for anyone to jump in. Does anyone have a favorite craft book? So everyone was talking there about novels. Does anyone have a craft book they'd recommend to, to audience members? The scientific method in any engineering book. <laughs> Memoir of Craft by Stephen King. Mm -hmm. Also on writing, um, Stephen King. And uh, yeah, in terms, that was, uh, Really, really helpful. Also for characterization and viewpoint, um, Orson Scott Card's book on that. Stephen King on writing. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I'd have to. Say, <laughs> I'd have to say Stephen King. That, that is a terrific book. His his book on writing is great. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, J. Michael Straczynski wrote a great book on script writing. That's also very good, where he has his very early drafts of The Changeling, which became the movie with Angelina Jolie and was written like, apparently first written like 15 years ago or something, but ultimately got made no movie. Okay. Thank you. Um, this next question is for Pat. Uh, what age did you know you wanted to be a writer? I think I, I knew when I was a child that I wanted to be a writer. Uh, I didn't actually, I, and I always wrote. I wrote from when I was probably nine, but I didn't always continue. I took very extremely long breaks for children, career, education, and so forth. But I think I always knew I wanted, that's what I really wanted to do if I could manage to make it work. The, the earliest I can remember thinking I wanted to be a writer was maybe when I was 12 or 13. Hmm. Uh, I think I think I always knew that I wanted to tell stories in some manner. Um, so, I mean, I've been writing, I've actually been writing seriously since I was 13 or 14, but uh, I made a lot of films and I dabbled in comic books a little bit, so. I'm kind of a late bloomer, I guess, by comparison. Uh, I read a lot of mystery and science fiction when I was young. And when I was in college, I was pre-med, so I only got three electives. But I took one in creative writing, and I got one of those amazing professors who just brought things out of me. And he planted the seed, I mean, decades ago. Uh, it took a while to grow, but uh, I'm forever grateful to him for that. So college. Writing is not my day job. Um, my husband calls it my expensive hobby. It is certainly the thing that I do to escape reality it is the place I go to play. Um, I didn't know this was the place that I went to play probably until I was about 30. Um, I'm so happy that I found it and I'm so happy that people enjoy the stories that I write. Uh, but no, this, this was a surprise to me. Thanks, everyone. Um, next question is from an audience member named Andrew Welsh Hopkins, and it's about editing. 
Um, so what is everyone's editing and rewriting process? Do you edit the previous day's work before starting anew, or do you plow through the, to the end of a draft without looking back and then only then start editing and revising? Oh, my, mine's kind of a, a, a mixture and maybe because of my very slow process of being a discovery writer, I, I will write a fair amount of the novel, maybe a third or a quarter, and then go back to the beginning and basically I suppose it amounts to starting over. It's, it's very intensive rewriting. I've, I've found out things since I started about characters, uh, maybe change some things, maybe my world that I have built my world for my fantasy novel has changed. So I, I but I don't do any line editing or anything for a while. When I am finally done with what I think, well, I'm partially through the novel. Um, I have a critique group that um, I, that with the, with Taylor that I submitted it to, and we all critique each other's work. And I kind of listened to that, but then I set it aside. I don't go back, look at those critiques and evaluate them and change things for, for until I'm actually doing the, uh, a, a further rewriting. So I don't do any line editing for quite a while. I try to get stuff down uh, so that I've at least got one draft, even if it's a bad first draft, because most first draft, it's almost a rule the first drafts are going to be bad. So it doesn't really bother me. So in order to do that, to get the first draft down, I will usually re-edit the previous, maybe the previous page. And I find that's a good way to sort of get myself into the new work. Um, and then the, now the overall editing, that's a whole, are, you, are, are they really asking, a, was the question about overall editing on the entire thing? Yeah, I think anything, um, any part of that question you want to touch on. What, what is editing for you as a writer? Okay, um, it's, well, well, okay, it, it's very similar to film editing, I think. You just get everything out there and then you cut, cut, cut mercilessly. Yeah. Uh, there was another thing that my, my late friend, Bob Flanagan, talked about it was uh be merciless with your editing and, and and he's very he was very correct on that for uh my process i will usually reread the previous chapter more to get myself back in the headspace that i left the characters in and if i see anything overt i'll clean it up but i usually it's usually just a read once i get through the book i then do two passes the first one I'll read top to bottom and again, kind of read for continuity, especially seeing because I, I don't necessarily write every day, whether I had some huge changes in emotion. And then the second read I read out loud and I, I try to fix as much of the grammar as I can. Uh, then I give it to a small group of beta readers. Um, I don't use writers as critiquers, I use readers. And really the list of questions are more like, did you get bored? What did you think of this character? Um, did I make you laugh? You know, things that I'm hoping to solicit out of the readers as they're going through my book. Um, then I react to those. Um, I use multiple readers because I try to understand a consensus. Some people will hate characters and that's fine. Some of them aren't in there for you to like. Um, but if I'm getting a consistent reaction that I'm not going for, well, then I may want to adjust for that. Once I go through that pass, it goes through a professional editor who uh, usually then does both a line edit for me, but he's also, uh, it's Chris Radigan, who's also the uh, publisher of All Due Respect, and he's just amazing at the genre and can find plot holes and really does an awesome job of just making sure that all the characters' reactions are Aeon. And then I do usually one or two edits after him, and, and then it's ready for print. Yeah, I'm very much uh, like Tina. I, I go over my last chapter to get into the space, to get into the head of the characters. And then I plow ahead trying to get to the next part of the book and hopefully to the end. Um, and when I've got things fairly under control, I start showing it to my critique group. And um, they, what, they're, what they're great about is pointing out where things are unclear. And then I can go back and, and clean it up those spots. 
and then I don't do any uh, line editing till I'm I'm done with content editing. And I'm not, I mean, I'm trained as a physician, so I'm not a great grammar person, but fortunately my publisher has a good content editor and a line editor to help me out. My process is pretty much the same. Uh, when, I, <clears throat> when I have a pretty good first draft, uh, I'll send it to maybe a dozen beta readers and get those comments back and incorporate them. And uh, my first novel, uh, came in at around 72,000 words. And when it was all done, I, it was at about 65. So I cut about 7,000 words before I was done. So the, the rule of thumb is, is uh, as you're editing or as you're writing, you'll keep adding and adding. Uh, and then when you get to the point where you, or you keep subtracting and subtracting, and when you get to the point where you can't absolutely can't cut anything else out, you're probably done. Thank you, everyone. Um, so the questions are now rolling in, which means that everyone is saying things that are of interest and the, and the audience has more and more what's asked. I think we are, we are coming close to our, to our hour time limit. So I'm actually going to read some of these last questions as a bundle, because I think they actually do connect to each other. And then I'll invite all of you to sort of um, address whichever part of this bundle feels most interesting and most compelling as the, as the final note. Um, and sorry, my child is yelling a bit in the background. Um, so the, the first question is from Victor Hess. Um, and the question is, at what point in your writing does a theme emerge? Does a theme break out? Um, such as drug abuse or poverty or prejudice or whatever the case may be. Um, that then I think touches very well on Sarah Perry's question, which is how do you decide which genre conventions to follow when you're writing, which ones to push back on or to discard? Um, and then there are a few more questions on the process level of what do you do when encountering a block, a block in your writing process, and how do you find a group of people um, upon whom or off whom to bounce. So that's sort of a bundle of questions. Um, there's certainly no need to try for all of you to try to answer every single element of that. But I think take that as you will, the questions either about finding a theme, encountering a block, pushing back on genre conventions or following them, and finding beta readers to help you move your, move your work forward. Um, OK. There's a friend of mine who will absolutely will not start writing until he knows the theme. So he knows that he's writing about freedom of the press and once he knows that, he goes. It would make me nuts. Um, and and it, work, it, it works for him, so I, I don't like to comment on other people's processes. But for myself, I find that I, usually, that I, I have to write in order to discover theme. I often don't know the theme until five or six drafts in there. Now, uh, theme, and then we're talking about blocks. Um, uh, okay, knock wood. I've never really had one. Uh, I'm not really sure what it is. You're talking about writer's block, in other words. That, like you just, yeah, uh, thankfully it's not something I've had. Um, and then in terms of readers, like, uh, I'm sorry, what was the third one? Was readers finding people to I think no, no need to answer every single question. I think maybe just touching on a few of them is enough, just, just in the interest of. Well, just, all right, as briefly as I can, I mean, I've got a couple of people that will read stuff that I've got a lot of very tolerant friends who thankfully <laughs> will read my stuff and let me know what they think, so, okay. Um, in terms of theme, I usually know my theme very, very early. I'm not gonna say I know it before I start because I think my characters um, usually come first along with aspects of the world building, but I know it very, very early and it's really essential to me and to what happens in my story along with the characters. Um, Talenor has a lot to do with duty and Jaina, her whole reason for the whole story and her struggle and her quest is to right a wrong that she had been a part of unknowingly but she takes responsibility and she has this duty and that kind of leads, um, leads onward. So that was really important to know early. 
Um, oh yeah, getting uh, stuck. <laughs> that happens to me. And sometimes it happens for a lot longer than, than I would, I mean, you never want it to happen, but um, sometimes it usually means to me when I'm really stuck that something's wrong with the story, but I don't necessarily know what it is. And I have to work it out, take walks, do use different uh, procedure. I mean, sometimes I'll introduce a new character, a minor character, or do something different in, to work out what's going on or what might be wrong with the story. Um, sorry, I'll let people go on since we're, I don't know what the other question was. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna pick up from Anne Marie because I, I think the exact same thing when it comes to blocks. Um, I don't get them often, but when I do get them, I usually realize that I've painted characters into a corner that they can't get out of. Uh, and so I, I generally have to back up either a chapter or two or in the sequence and find another path. It's almost like feeling your way through a maze. Mm -hmm. Or the other thing I realize is that I've gotten bored and that is not a good thing. If, if I've gotten bored with the story, how am I gonna expect in a reader to be interested? So to some extent, I have to back up then too and say, okay, where did I get down into the weeds? Where did I jump into a rabbit hole and pull myself out? And, and I'll touch on the idea of pushing back on, uh, on genre rules. I really think that that's driven by your characters and the story. So if you write different series, you're gonna find that the different characters push back on different sets of rules and some stories, some characters rely on those rules, like they can't exist without them. So rather than sitting down and saying, okay, I'm going to do a police procedural and I'm going to do this, it, it's going to be an evolution of the character. Most of my characters don't have the patience for procedure and I don't know where they got that from. Um, and so you, you have to a lot, let a lot of it happen organically and be open to directions that you didn't plan on. In, uh, in my case, in the first book, uh, DEROS, which is an acronym that stands for Date of Expected Return from Overseas, I knew my theme. Uh, Father Jake is getting back from uh, a brutal war and trying to put his life back together. It's, it's not a story about war, but it's a story about coming home. That's the theme. Um, and after I wrote that, it led to the theme of the second book. Uh, which is his family, and which then led to the theme in the third book, and strangely enough, has led to the theme in the fourth book I'm working on. So that's been that's been kind of fun for me. Uh, so theme is early for me. As far as writer's blocks, when I get blocked, I go I write poetry for a little bit and just change change my mindset completely, and things seem to open up again. I I pretty much know the theme early on. Um, and that's sort of a guiding light through the book. Uh, if I get stuck, it's usually because I've lost touch with my character somehow. So I'll go, I like to get ideas when I'm out walking. So I'll walk and I'll let the characters talk to me. And because um, you can lose touch with them, I think, if you haven't been writing for a while or for whatever reason. But I think if you, if you get back in touch with your characters, I think they'll tell you where to go. Wonderful. Um, thank you, everyone. So, what a what a joy to get to spend this digital hour with um, with the five of you and with all of our attendees. Um, really appreciate everyone's time, insight, and wisdom. And so, I guess uh, a digital round of applause for for these five brilliant authors. Thank you, everybody. It's great meeting you. Or, thank you. I've thank enjoyed you this. Thank you. Quote meeting you. One quote. So, okay. Thank you. Great, great Wonderful. questions, Memorial. Yes, thank you so much. Good questions. Thank and you. yeah, all of them were. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye bye. bye.